I think we can finally say it. Spring is here. And you don't even have to drive a mile out of town to see the fields that are getting ready. Many of the farmers have started planting, and some are beginning to see tender shoots begin to even come up. And not just farmers. Bedding plants are showing up in all our favorite garden stores, luring and begging us with their burst of colors, saying, take me home. I may be one of the few who still observe the Mother's Day rule when it comes to planting. The rule is, don't plant anything until after Mother's Day. And yes, I've been caught with that last freeze of the season several times when I've given in to my chomping at the bit to plant. And so I thought this little passage of scripture would really speak to us this morning about spring. This parable is only found in Mark's Gospel. And the emphasis of it is a little different than, say, the parable of the sower, where the farmer is planting seeds of different kinds of soils. And that parable talks about the importance of proper soil for the growth of the seed and stresses the success of the harvest. Here, we look at the mysterious power of the seed itself to produce a crop. Jesus has been speaking to a large crowd of people gathered around him by the lake shore. It's a series of parables that he taught sitting in a boat while the people were on land. And later, when Jesus was alone with his disciples, they asked him what these stories meant. He shared the parable of the farmer scattering seed, the parable of the lamp, not keeping it under a bushel, but let it on, put it on a stand so it can shine. And then he shared this parable of the growing seed, followed by the parable of the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds that become the largest of all green plants, garden plants. And all these parables have a common root, if you will, to keep in the planting theme, a common message of Jesus' teaching about faith. This particular story relates to the kingdom of God and how that kingdom grows. And for all of us who are so closely tied with the Lord, whether farmers or gardens, gardeners, we can relate. All the farmer has to do is plant the seed in the suitable ground. The farmer cannot make the seed grow nor understand how it works. Ask anyone. How does a seed go from this tiny, almost shell-like pod into a green leafy plant? And they can't tell you because it just grows. What is that spark that sets it off? And much of it, it's much like the question that God asked Job. Who sends the rain to satisfy the parched ground and make the tender grass spring up? The answers are a mystery something beyond human capabilities, but not outside our belief in the all-present, all-powerful Creator God. Planting seeds, that wonderful metaphor for teaching and sharing the Word of God with someone else. When we first moved to Indy in the 1980s, I started attending a very large church nearby. And I joined a group of women who were studying a book during the season of Advent. And one lesson was about planting seeds, meaning growing in faith. And each woman in the room said, I hope the seeds I'm planting in my children, meaning reading Bible stories and taking them to Sunday school, will take root and they'll grow up to be good Christians. Well, this was before my daughter was born, and so in one sense, I couldn't really relate. I said to them, you know, so many times when I think I'm going to say something, to plant a seed and it will really make a difference in that person's life, so often it doesn't. But when I'm not thinking about it and just say something sort of off the cuff, I usually hear later, oh, you know, that really made a difference to me. I planted a seed and wasn't aware of it. Think about the seeds you plant in your conversations with others. Are you aware of the impact of your words and actions and what they make on another person? 
even when you least expect it. The farmer scatters the seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows. And sometimes, like a watch pot that never boils, the growth of the seedling is tiny and imperceptible. It's only when we look at it uh, and then look again after an interval of time that we notice the difference. We can say that about our faith, too, can't we? We might not notice much of a change since yesterday, but if we look back to last year or even five years ago, how has your faith in Jesus Christ grown? Or are there still some dead branches that need to be pruned? And whether the farmer is asleep or awake, the seeds keep growing. It does it on its own. First a little shoot, then the stalk, and then finally there's a full ear of corn. It's that way with our faith, too. First we hear the message of Jesus Christ, then we read and study the Bible, and finally we live out the truths that show everyone whose we are. Or as the Old Testament prophet Hosea quoted God as saying, Plant the good seeds of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of my love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. And there are other lessons embedded in these few verses of Mark's Gospel, which I draw from William Barclay, renowned theologian. We learn that nature grows constantly, day and night, he says. And sadly, for us humans, our spiritual growth is more spasmodic. One day we take a step forward, the next day two steps back. But the work of God continues quickly, unceasingly, as God's plan for us unfolds. And for all that to come to fruition, we need three things. Patience, hope, and preparation. Instead of rushing around, fretting and stewing, we need to cultivate in our souls the patience which has learned to wait on God. We are living today in an atmosphere of despair. People despair of the world. Recent events of insurrection, hate crimes, mass shootings continue to fill every media outlet. People despair of the church and look, and look with dread toward the future. And yet we need to cling to the words of the writer of Hebrews. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And lastly, preparation. We must prepare, like the farmer and the gardener, who prepare the soil, plant the seeds of faith, and nurture them as they grow. Even Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, used the planting thing to make his point. He introduced Apollos, who was a man considered to be in the knowledge of Christ, or well-versed in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 3, ch chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, we learn that Apollos met Paul in Ephesus, and then went to Corinth, preaching and teaching to all who would listen about Jesus Christ. Paul refers to Apollos in verse 6 as, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Think for a moment. Who in your life planted the seeds of your faith? Who watered those seeds? Verse 7, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God, who makes things grow. The words of William Barclay, If we live in patience, which cannot be defeated, in hope, which cannot despair, and in preparation, which always sees light in the light of eternity, we shall, by the grace of God, be ready for his consummation when it comes. Plant 
plant this good news of Jesus Christ in your hearts and let it grow in you to share with others. And what better time than now to begin preparing? Let us come to the table.